Okay, now, keys do not have to be strings. I could say sparse, I, I could say observations equals <coughs> time zero, signal strength is 172.5, time four, signal strength was 171.3, time 11, signal strength was 170.9, and time 20, signal strength was 168.8. Okay. Def get signal strength of observations and index. If index is a key in the observations, let's just change that to data and make it clear which is the parameter. If index is a key, return data at index, else return zero. What am I doing? I'm saying I've only got four real samples. Now, I could write this down like this. Okay, my stuff equals location zero has a value, location one is zero, location two is zero, location three is zero, location four was 171.3, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And now I can just say my stuff at index, all right? Instead of saying, for example, my stuff at location 15, instead of saying get signal strength from observations at location 15. Sorry, a bit of typing. I wanted to get that all on the screen. Here is the naive way to store a sparse sample. I've got observations from t equals 0 up to t equals 20. Most of them are zeros. I don't have any data there. Sorry, but I don't. Okay. So I'm storing the ones that are non-zero, and then I'm spending memory to store all of those zeros. And in a case where the sampling frequency is about 1 in 5, OK, maybe that makes sense. If my sampling frequency is 1 in 5,000, I'm storing a lot of zeros to no good purpose. This is storing all the useful information. I'm saying that at time zero, it was that. At time four, it was that. At time 11, it was that. At time 20, it was that. And if I don't have one written down, it was zero. So I need a function to say, OK, you've given me the time index into the signal. If I've got some data, I'll give you that back. And if not, I'll give you back the zero. Okay. This is using a lot less memory than that. I mean, dictionaries are more expensive than lists, but I've got four times two is eight entries here. I've got 20 entries here. The overhead on the dictionary is not a factor of two and a half. It's about a factor of 10% over a list, 10 to 12, okay? So uh, don't quote me on the 10 to 12. Things keep changing. They keep tuning it. But here, I'm storing eight numbers plus a bit of admin overhead. Down here, I'm storing 20. Okay, so even on space, this one probably wins. And I think this is clearer than that. I think this tells you where I've got non-zero values, and it's immediately obvious what the time indexes of the non-zero values are, because I've written them down. Here, if you're reading this, what's the time index of the 170.9? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, 7, 7. Crap, one, two, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six. I wish the phone would stop ringing, eight, nine, and so forth, right? This is clear. Okay. So here's another good reason to use it. When you've got sparsely sampled data, when you've only got information in a few places, store it this way. Think about a phone book. There are a lot of possible arrangements of the characters in the Latin alphabet, but you probably don't see a phone book entry for AQXLMPT. Nobody has that name. We store the names and the phone numbers because the set of all names is actually pretty sparse compared to the set of all possible permutations of the letters in the alphabet. You'll come up with the same thing over and over again when you're working with real data sets. Store the key and the value because the key isn't immediately obvious. And because you've only got a few values. Okay. So let's have a few, let's have a look at a few other things we can do here.
for key in observations. Print key and observations of key. And I'm going to change that name. Excuse me. To signal to save myself some typing. Signal equals that. For key and signal, print key and signal of key. If I enlarge this just a little bit, there we go. Still visible at the back? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's what it's done. I've said, here's a for loop. Four on a string gives you back the characters one at a time. Four on a list gives you back the elements one at a time. Four on a dictionary could give you back either the keys one at a time, or the values one at a time, or both. It gives you the keys. Again, that's what most people want most of the time. So that's what Python does. The for loop says, give me a key, and then I will use it to look up the value associated with that key. Then we come around and we get another key, and another key, and another key. Notice again, they're not coming out in the order they were written in. I'm getting 0, 20, 11, 4. Okay. Here's the one thing that people trip over most often using dictionaries, and it's nothing to do with Python. You'll get this in every language. I said the cost of using them is that we have to spend a bit of extra memory. There is a second cost, and it's one that is counterintuitive. But if you watch the episode, I can explain it. I have to randomize the order in which I store things in order to make access fast. That makes no sense, but it's true. What I have to do is take those keys and use what is called a hash function. You don't call it hash. Hash is chopped meat. right? To make a hash of things. Chop it all up, right? A hash function takes a number or a string or some other piece of data and grinds it and produces some number. Okay? It takes arbitrary data's input and it produces an integer's output. That integer tells us where to go and look in our data structure and memory to find a particular entry. We want to see if 11 is a key. We put 11 into our hash function. It goes garble, 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 and it says, go and check location 4,971. Why 4971? There's no reason. It's just we have to randomize the association between keys and locations in order to get good behavior. I explain why in the episodes online. I won't go to it here, but if you're bored this evening, watch a little bit of video. Okay. 